Okay, so welcome to the Virginia Cyber Range uh, Cybersecurity Education Weekly WebEx. Um, maybe I'll call it a weekly podcast today because we don't have um, a whole crowd of watchers. Hopefully we have viewers later on. Um, <clears throat> so I will dive right in here. Um, folks have seen this overview. We do this every week. Uh, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. if you want to join us live. Otherwise, we record these sessions and share them. And um, if you have any particular topics you'd like to see, please um, send an email to contact at virginiacyberrange.org or uh, send me an email. I was just writing down an idea that I have for one of these uh, later on. Okay, so um, we'll start with some recent news. Um, <clears throat> if you're a... Um, Bitcoin or uh, or a cryptocurrency uh, investor, um, the, the you're probably aware of of uh, the recent state of things, at least with regard to Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin prices are have fallen pretty pretty uh, st uh, steeply over the last um, several weeks, really very steeply over the last week or so. Um, so. The question is why is that happening, and it's not clear why that's happening. Um, you know, so of course, um, Bitcoin is is um, cryptocurrency based on blockchain technology, um, and uh, it's it's actually sort of interesting um, technology if you're if you're um, into that kind of thing, um, based obviously on on crypto. And uh, and I'll do a blockchain. Uh, um, discussion or two uh, on this WebEx at some point in the future because because there's there's lots of different uses lots of different potential uses for blockchain technology um, cryptocurrency is only one of them um, and so people have talked about using blockchain for um, voting uh, using blockchain for various kinds of record keeping um, even use potentially using blockchain for uh, cybersecurity um, and in some ways um, you know I mean there are there are uh, there are situations in which blockchain technology could help in a cybersecurity scenario. Lots of ways it wouldn't help at all. Um, it's certainly not any sort of a panacea, but it, but it's an interesting technology um, and could have a lot of use cases. In some ways, it's kind of a solution looking for a problem right now. So there are companies that are um, that are investing in blockchain and doing a lot of work in this area. And, and in fact, there's one large company in uh, right here in the uh, Corporate Research Center in Blacksburg uh, called Block One that has um, had $4 billion or so in investment and they're putting together a very specific blockchain technology. Um, um, and, and, you know, they're looking for Customers are there. You know, lots of these companies are looking for a sort of the killer app that'll make a whole bunch of people use blockchain. And if you think of, um, you know, technology as it's kind of arisen, um, you know, there there generally has to be some sort of um, uh, you know killer application for, for the technology in order for it to find widespread use. And so I'll just use the internet as an example. You know, the internet was was um, not super widely used. Um, uh, from its inception in the, you know, 1960s up until really about the 1990s was when, you know, most people, was when a lot of people uh, started getting uh, internet access in their homes. And why did they get that? Well, they got it because the World Wide Web became a thing in the, in the early 1990s. And now there was a reason for people to get internet access. So, so in terms of the internet, um, you know, it had been used for, 20 or 30 years by um, by educators and by engineers and scientists basically to send emails to each other and to share research data but but in order for the wider population to really get uh, use out of it um, it was the World Wide Web that made the internet a thing um, so so the question is what's what's the thing that makes blockchain um, you know super widespread and widely used um, you know Bitcoin is one use case for blockchain but it just turns out that Bitcoin is, um, you know, for a lot of reasons, it's it's inefficient and um, and all of a sudden it's not worth very much money, right? So at its peak, Bitcoin was worth almost uh, a, a single Bitcoin was worth uh, almost twenty thousand dollars, and as of this morning, uh, one one Bitcoin is worth three thousand seven hundred dollars. So it's lost. Um, 
over 80% of its value since a year ago. <clears throat> um, now, does that mean that that Bitcoin is uh, going to die? Probably not. Um, sure, it'll, you know, certainly something will happen and it'll probably go up again at some point in the future. But um, for right now, it's down pretty low. So, if, so um, it's a good time to buy, maybe. Um, so here's an interesting analysis of um, of the value of Bitcoin right now. So, so on the left side of the slide here, I have a a, a, um, a tweet from Bruce Potter. Bruce Potter is a pretty um, uh, you know well known, uh, well established inf information security professional. He um, runs an annual conference called ShmooCon, which is one of the premier. Uh, cybersecurity cons in the country. It's in Washington, D.C. Um, every year. Um, and a uh, great conference if you're, uh, if you're, it's very hard to get tickets for, but it's a great conference um, if you're into that kind of thing. So he, he sends out this tweet and, and I'll do, I'll translate it a little bit. So, so for, and, the, and I'm doing the translation for people who maybe aren't, aren't, aren't uh, blockchain people. So he's, what he says here is quick uh, back of the napkin, Bitcoin math for today. Current hash rate is 45,000 petahashes per second. So the pH slash S petahashes per second. Uh, assume everyone mines with an E10. So an E10 is a purpose-built cryptocurrency mining computer. And these, these uh, you know, this is a consumer system. So there are people who build their own crypto mining computers. Um, you know, they use special purpose-built hardware. And uh, an E10 is a consumer Bitcoin miner that you can buy. Um, there's a backlog. So if you wanted to buy one today, you'd be on a waiting list probably for months. But um, it's a pretty common, uh, widely used system. <clears throat> so he says, assume everyone mines with an E10 at 11 uh, billion hashes per joule. So his 11 BH slash J here, billion hash, 11 billion hashes. And of course, a joule is a measurement of energy usage. So a joule is one watt second. Um, then he says, assume super cheap electricity at $0.05 per kilowatt hour. So 0 0.05, you know, so, that, so that's, uh, you know, whatever, f five cents per kilowatt hour. Um, that's, um, so, so using that math, so he, so he says um, 95,000 kilowatts, kilowatt hours per Bitcoin. So if you take 95,000 kilowatt hours times five cents per kilowatt hour, it costs $4,750 to, to mine a single Bitcoin. He, and he, then he says, Bitcoin is currently trading at $4,330. This was as of the 24th of November. So this is last week. So basically what he's saying here is that um, it costs more to mine a coin than they're worth. Uh, and then the the reply from Chris Weissenpaul, he's another um, he's another old school uh, infosec guy. Um, this he, later that day, it had gone from forty three thirty down to thirty eight sixty nine. So he says, turn off your miners. Basically, he's saying it's costing you more to mine Bitcoin than the Bitcoin is worth, so you should not mine it. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of an interesting economic question, right? Is that the case? Should if if it costs me more to create a Bitcoin than the Bitcoin is worth, should I stop? Should I stop mining it? Um, so that assumes that it won't go up again later, right? So. Um, <clears throat> So if I if I mine a bunch of Bitcoin later, you know, mine a bunch of Bitcoin now, and then and then next week it's worth ten thousand dollars again, then certainly I did the right thing. Um, if it continues to go down, then I'm then I'm making a mistake. Um, so it's so all this Bitcoin um, business is all you know it's 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 betting on on what might happen in the future, obviously. Um, <clears throat> another interesting uh, um, side note in all this is if um, you know, if, if the miners were all to say, hey, Bitcoin is worth less than what it cost me to, to, to mine it, I'm going to stop mining Bitcoin until it's worth more. If everybody was to do that, then uh, Bitcoin would lose its, all its, all Bitcoin would lose all its value because um, the whole ecosystem relies on miners. So the fact that a Bitcoin is created during the mining process is, is, is simply an incentive for Bitcoin miners to mine Bitcoin. The miners are there to, um, to record the transactions and create this uh, unmutable digital ledger uh, that is the blockchain. And without people mining blockchain, then, um, then the whole thing ceases to exist. I mean, it'll still exist, but, but um, 
the ecosystem will stop functioning because you can't use cryptocurrency if there's nobody uh, maintaining the ledger and the people who maintain the ledger are the Bitcoin miners. So if they all stopped, the whole system would break down. Um, so I would say that Bitcoin might be in a little bit of a precar precarious position. There certainly has been a reduction in the, in the percentage of people um, mining Bitcoin. So I looked at a graph yesterday and it looked like, I don't know, 15 to 20% of miners had stopped mining, perhaps waiting for the price to go up. But um, again, um, the people who are still mining Bitcoin, despite the fact that, that it costs them more to create a Bitcoin than the Bitcoin is worth, is them simply betting that the price is going to go back up later. Uh, the graph in the lower right here is just the, the Bitcoin, the, the price of Bitcoin over the last year. So a year ago, it was um, trading at around 7000 I don't know, it looks like, yeah, about $7,000. Got up close to twenty k uh, at the end of December of, of last year. And since then, it's just been kind of trending up and down. And now it's down at around, again, as of this morning, it was at um, almost exactly $3,700. So this is a bit of interesting Bitcoin math that your students might be interested in. <clears throat> uh, here's another news story. Um, and this is from Krebs on security. So if you've been listening to these um, weekly WebExes, you know, Krebs is kind of one of my go-to um, InfoSec people. He's a, a researcher and author, and he keeps this blog, uh, Krebs on Security. Um, very well respected uh, InfoSec professional who, who uh, you know, is is uh, you know his his um, blogs are, are pretty widely read. He says uh, half of all phishing sites now have the padlock, and so what padlock is he talking about? Of course, he's talking about the uh, the little green padlock. You know, so we've told people for years. Um, hey, if you're going to use your credit card on, on a website, make sure that you see the padlock. And, and the padlock means that the website is using HTTPS, um, which is a secure form of the hypertext transfer protocol. And that's, you know, and uh, uh, hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, is the language of the World Wide Web. And so if you're going to use your credit card at a website, uh, it's got to have the, it's got to have a lock icon or it's got to be an HTTPS site or or if that's not the case, then you're basically sending your credit card information over an unsecure channel. And um, previously on these WebExes, we've talked about uh, the fact that, um, you know, for example, if you're transmitting um, data over a wireless connection and um, you're not using HTTPS, then anybody within wireless, ac within wireless range of your computer could eavesdrop on that message and they can see things like your credit card number and your um, expiration date and your CVV number and all that stuff. So you don't, so you certainly don't want to send credit card information over a non HTTPS site. Um, what's, what's, what's not the case though is, um, you know, the lock still means that you're transmitting over HTTPS, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the website itself is legitimate. So here's a, a Krebs um, refers to a survey where he says 80% of respondents believe that the lock indicates a legitimate or safe website. Well, that's not the case at all. Again, the lock only indicates that it's a secure connection. So it could be a secure connection to a, to a illegitimate website. Um, so the lock indicates the secure connection between client and server, not that the site is safe. Okay, so how do you know that the site is safe or not? <clears throat> um, and I've given a, I've put up a couple of examples here on the slide, and these are um, these are straight out of the story from Krebs on security. Um, Really, the best way is to look at the URL itself. And so the URL up here in this pay, so this is a bogus PayPal login page. And so, you know, what you might see in your email, if you dig through your spam, you might see an email that says, uh, you know, hey, your PayPal credentials are, um, have been frozen. Please click on this link and uh, reactivate your site by typing in your username and password. And then you click on the link, and it's not really PayPal. It's whatever this is, Web Verify, Verify Web Scrid something. You know, so this is this is um, it's not PayPal.com. Looks like PayPal, but you know the the web content itself is easily scraped off off the legitimate PayPal site, and you could you could. Um, recreate this page easily. And so what, what that hacker is trying to do is get you to type in your PayPal credentials. Of course, those are passed securely to the hacker. Um, and then he can use them to log into your PayPal site and um, 
do whatever he wants to do, change your um, information, start spending your PayPal money. Um, and um, so PayPal is another one of those places where you want to use two-factor and PayPal is set up for that. If you're not using two-factor on PayPal, then then you should uh, you should pause this webcast and go change your configuration right now. The other example I'm showing here is uh, Facebook, right? So this is another account verification bogus mess. You know, somebody sends you a message that says verify your account. And how do you know this is bogus? Well, again, look at the URL. That's not facebook.com. And I don't think Facebook is going to hire some uh, cheesy uh, 000 webhostapp.com uh, organization to verify accounts for them. So, um, so the bottom line is, um, you know, look at the URL. If it doesn't look like the legitimate uh, um, company that that is purported to be, then then you're probably being misled. So if it's a PayPal login site, it should say paypal.com up there. If it's a Facebook account verification site, you know, it should say um, facebook.com. The other thing you can do, so look at the URL. That's how you, that's number one, how you protect yourself. The other thing you can do is, you know, the browsers nowadays, <clears throat> over the last, I don't know, year maybe, they've been um, doing things to help protect consumers by um, keeping track of known bogus um, uh, websites, bo known bogus uh, uh, DNS records, which, you know, that those are, um, DNS translates between domains and, and, um, and um, IP addresses. And so there are, you know, increasingly, really on a daily basis, um, hackers are adding bad domains to the to the uh, DNS system and registering them so they can take advantage of people. And as those things are discovered, the website uh, or the the web client um, vendors are adding notifications into the into the uh, web browsers that warn you when you're going to a, a potentially malicious site. And so here. Um, I, I have an example here. So this um, was a website I tried to go to that I know is bad um, earlier today. And um, Chrome, the Chrome web browser um, gave me this warning before it would let me go to it. Deceptive site ahead, attackers on www.buybox.com may trick you, yada, yada, yada. So um, of course this would have let me um, ignore this uh, security error. If I if I wanted to, if I clicked on the details button down here, there would have been an option for me to continue to the site. Um, so these are these are not things that are going to prevent you from going to malicious websites, but they'll warn you if the if the place that you're going is is suspicious. Um, so don't ignore warnings from your browser is the other way to protect yourself. So that so this is a little bit of practical security that you can share with your students, and I would uh, encourage you to take a look at this Krebs on security. Um, um, blog that was put up within the last couple of days. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, enough news. I kept that to 22 minutes. That's not bad. Uh, enough news. T today we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, network fundamentals. And uh, so I'm going to switch my switch my slideshow here. Whoops, what did I do? I accidentally unshare, so I'm gonna reshare screen shares. Um, and I'm gonna put up this other slideshow. <clears throat> um, okay, we started on this last week. So if you recall, we talked about layered network model. We talked a little bit about data encapsulation. We did define network protocols, talked about a little bit about how things function at the physical layer. Next layer up is a data link layer, then the network layer. We talked about IP addresses, um, talked about um, some uh, different protocols at the, uh, at the network layer, and then the IPv4 header. Um, and then above the network layer is the transport layer, process to process communication. So for example, a web browser on my laptop talking to a web server at some, uh, uh, in some organization. And then, uh, talked about port numbers connecting between processes on different uh, computer systems. Uh, transport layer protocols, we talked a little bit about TCP and UDP. There's the TCP header. We uh, briefly touched on uh, TCP connection setup. So the whole uh, um, ACK, SYNAC, uh, uh, SYN, SYNAC, ACK, uh, three-way handshake. 
Um, and then we finished here talking about application layer protocols. And um, so if you um, didn't view last week's uh, WebEx, then I encourage you to do that. We covered most of this uh, slide deck in, uh, during last week. So what I wanna do today is I wanna uh, finish this uh, deck and then I just wanna do a very quick, um, some, some um, networking hands-on exercises just to reinforce some of these concepts and then I think maybe next week we'll do a little bit more detailed hands-on where I'll have you uh, join a, a course in the in the Virginia Cyber Range and we'll work through um, one or more hands-on exercises related to, to computer networking. And then th those are exercises that either are in our course or repository or will be imminently. And then you can take those, um, take those exercises and, and do them with your students. But today the hands-on will just be, um, a little bit, a uh, little bit quicker. So, um, so one thing we haven't, well, so I've, I've touched on this previously, but we haven't talked in detail about um, this topic is network address translation. And um, what network address translation does is it, is it um, sort of defined here, right? It, it substitutes one IP address, whoops, my pen's not working, substitutes one IP address and or port for another. Um, and um, so there are a couple of different variations of this. There's basic network address translation that translates one IP address into another IP address. So that's a direct one-to-one -one transformation. And then there's port address translation that allows multiple hosts to use a single public IP address. Um, and um, this is what we use in most cases. And uh, many of you use port address translation every day, um, you, but you don't know it. Um, and where you use that is in your home wireless access point, right? So here's my crude drawing of a wireless access point. Uh, most of us have these in our homes these days. And, uh, and I'll uh, refer to that more in the, in the next slide. Um, um, network address translation can be static or dynamic. So, um, so I can tie a specific uh, internal IP address to, to, an ex to a specific external IP address, or I can do it dynamically. Um, and that really depends on, on um, how many IP addresses you're working with. And, and uh, you know, that's not something we need to talk too much about. The benefits are listed here. So one of the benefits is it allows, it allows you to share IP addresses. And when would you want to share an IP address? Well, the classic example that I'll use is in your home network, your ISP, whether that's the cable company or the phone company or whoever provides your high-speed uh, internet connection, they assign a single IP address to your home. Uh, of course, inside our homes, we have um, lots of different, I'll go to my next slide here. Inside our homes, we have lots of different um, um, internet connected devices and each one of these things has its own IP address. And so um, how is it that we can have multiple IP addresses inside uh, a home network all sharing the same IP address provided by the, uh, by the ISP? Well, the way we do that is through um, net, uh, network address translation. And so uh, my, um, so here's, here's um, a cable modem. So in, at least in my home, I have a wired connection to my internet service provider and that's the cable company. And out here I have some IP address and um, I'm not sure what it is. So I'm going to make one up. Let's say it's 19.17.2.3. So that's the single IP address provided uh, to my, uh, pr provided to me by my uh, hosting company. And then inside of my home, I have a whole bunch of different wireless devices. And these things have IP addresses like 192.168.0.3 and 192.168.0.4, 192.168.0.5, et cetera, et cetera. For the, I don't know, 20 or 30 wireless devices I have in my home that have IP addresses. And, and that's not an exaggeration. So if you think about, uh, you know, in, in your home, you have laptops, you have um, 
printers, you have uh, um, smartphones, you have tablets, you have smart TVs, you have uh, Roku devices, you have um, maybe an Amazon Alexa or two, um, you might have a, a smart thermostat. Um, I mean, there's all these different IoT devices and computers and tablets, and each one of those things has its own IP address. And um, so you, you, you might be surprised if you uh, logged into your uh, wireless access point and just looked at the list of devices on your network. <clears throat> and hopefully those are all your devices. So, so here you have the wireless access point and this thing is the, the wireless access point is what's actually providing IP addresses to all these other devices in the network using a protocol called DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. That's not um, uh, maybe something that you need to know, but, but that all happens automatically. And um, what the wireless access point does is it does network address translation. So each time your laptop, for example, that has this 192.168.0.3 address, each time it connects to a website out here on the internet, so here's the internet, what happens is that request goes from uh, your laptop to your wireless access point, excuse me, your wireless access point, the um, wireless access point uh, converts your um, internal IP address, which is this thing, to your external IP address, which is this thing, and then it sends the request out through your cable modem into the internet. And that translation has to happen because the only way that packet is gonna get routed back to your home network is by using that external IP address, which in this case is 19.17.2.3. If the, um, I mean, the, the, so the, the internet wouldn't even route 192.168.0.3. Um, that's a non-routable IP address. Um, because, um, you know, probably 80% uh, of the homes in the U.S. that have their own wireless access point has a device that has the IP address 192.168.0.3. Um, and if you log into your own wireless access point, or if you uh, do, an, do an IP config on your home computer, you'll see a similar IP address. Um, so those are particular kinds of IP addresses that are meant to be used inside a uh, what's called a NAT gateway. Um, and that's the function that your wireless access point is, uh, is providing. Okay, so that's network address translation. Um, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. And I, and I talked about that um, in the first um, network uh, fundamentals introduction a couple of, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Um, so that's, uh, if, if you, you know, I use that example as a, as a local area network and I also talked a little bit about the network address translation part of it. <clears throat> but, um, so the benefits of network address translation, number one is what I just showed you, it allows for sharing of IP addresses. Um, the second benefit is it improves the security of systems behind the NAT device. Okay, how does it improve the security of those systems? Well, <clears throat> Here's how it improves the security of those systems. These systems inside your home network are, are all, um, could potentially all communicate with each other. In fact, your printer probably has some open ports. And um, I forget what the standard uh, printer ports are, but, but um, if your printer, for example, had the port 190 available, um, so that your different wireless devices could print stuff through that printer. Um, that, because you're using network address translation, that open port is only uh, visible to systems inside your home network. If somebody was to be scanning your network from outside out here in the internet, so if somebody did a scan out here, they would see 19.17.2.3, they would see that IP address, but but your port number that's being shared by your printer is not visible through the NAT gateway. That's just the nature of a NAT gateway. It's designed to not share that port unless you take action to do that specifically yourself. So it's possible for you to share that port out, out through your NAT gateway, but by default that, that functionality is blocked. Um, and why is it blocked? Well, because it would, be, it would be horrendous for security if everybody's network printers inside their homes were visible on the open internet, uh, then anybody could connect to your printer and uh, either print malicious documents to it um, or, they could, um, or they could take over the web interface and hack your printer. Um, 
So the fact that um, the NAT gateway blocks those kinds of, uh, um, you know, blocks those open ports on all these devices is pretty significant uh, improvement in security. In fact, your printer, if you, have a, if you do have a wireless printer in your home, it almost certainly has port 80 open. Port 80 is the port for HTTP. And why would your printer have the HTTP port open? Well, that's how you log into it to configure it. So most IoT devices are running a web server. Your printer is running a web server. Your wireless access point is running a web server. Um, some of your other, uh, you know, your, your wireless thermostat may be running a web server. And that's so that you can log into that device and, and, uh, and configure it from within your network. Of course, those web server uh, IP addresses are not shared through your NAT gateway um, or we'd all be in trouble. So that's how security is improved by network address translation. Um, <clears throat> sort of an advanced topic, maybe not something for introductory students studying computers and networking. A lot of your students may um, know that this is a thing, right? If they're, if they're the person who manages their home network, um, uh, or if they, uh, you know, if, if their parents sort of teach them how to configure this stuff, they may have some understanding of how some of this works and, and this sort of fleshes out the, the, their understanding of it. So perhaps a discussion worth having with them. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> so uh, Windows networking. So uh, I'm gonna do a little quick hands-on with, with uh, a Windows system. And so, pretty sure I'm still sharing here. I'm still sharing, yeah. So I'm gonna open up a terminal window. And I'm gonna do that by pressing my Windows key and then I'm gonna start typing, typing uh, terminal and I get this command prompt thing. All right, so here's my command prompt. And, um, and some of the basic um, things that I can do uh, related to network from from the command prompt are things like I can do an IP config. And IP config gives me information about the network configuration of my computer. And um, so if you look at, uh, so, so this system has several different um, network interfaces. Um, there's uh, various wireless adapters. There's Bluetooth adapter. There's a Ethernet adapter for VMware. So I'm running VM virtual machine software on this laptop. Um, really, the the relevant one here for today is this uh, is this uh, network interface labeled wireless LAN adapter Wi-Fi. So this is my wireless interface card. That's that allows my laptop to communicate with the network in this building, which of course is connected to the larger Virginia Tech network and um, gets me out to the internet. And I have an IP address here. So my IP version four address is 172.30.32.86. And um, there's also information, other information about um, about the IP uh, networking that no, we're not gonna talk about. Um, the gateway, so there's this default gateway, 172.30.0.1. That is the next hop in my connection to the internet. So um, in order for my computer to connect out to the internet, it has to know what, um, what system it has to, you know, what the router is that connects it out to the internet. And in this case, it's this uh, router at 172.30.0.1. I also have an IPv6 by IP version six address up here at the top. Um, and this is something that we talked about uh, last week very briefly. Um, so um, if you're interested in IPv6, this is the IPv6 address. I'm not gonna delve into it very deeply right now. So I can, I can um, see my uh, IPv4 address. I can also use a t utility called ping to do things like check connectivity to other systems in the network. And so I can send a ping message to my default gateway that's at 172.30.0.1 and hopefully it answers. Yeah, there it is answering, look at that. So um, what ping does, it just sends a message to that system and it looks for a response. And so ping can be used for, um, I mean, it's a, it's a tool that's intended to be used 
to uh, troubleshoot networks, right? If you're a network administrator and you're trying to make sure that a system is up on your network, you know, the first thing you do is, is you try to ping it and that's just gonna elicit a response from that system. So if that system is up and operating, it'll respond to the ping request and you'll get this, like I got here, I got a reply from 172.3.0.1. Um, and it took four milliseconds for the round trip. Uh, if that, if there was no reply, so let's, let's try to ping another system. Okay, so I, here I'm pinging a system that appears to not exist on the network, 172.30.0.2, and here I'm getting messages that say destination host unreachable. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so ping could be used, you know, certainly can be used for, for network troubleshooting, and that's, again, what it was designed for. How, you know, this is something that you could chat with your students about, you know, what, how else could you use the ping command in a network? If, if you were uh, a malicious person trying to um, take advantage of computers in some organization, um, uh, how, you know, what might you, you know, how, how could you use ping to do that? Well, first you need to know um, what the IP address range is for the organization. And there, there are ways that you can use um, reconnaissance to do that. And we will talk um, in a future discussion on, on how to do um, both passive and active reconnaissance to find out things like what's the IP address range of an organization. Uh, but once you have the IP address range of the organization, um, you know, just because uh, an organization has, uh, you know, several hundred or several thousand IP addresses assigned to them, that certainly doesn't mean that they're using all those IP addresses, you know, so there may not be hosts that are connect that, that are alive on each one of those addresses. So if you're a hacker trying to um, take advantage of an organization, the first thing you might want to do is identify what IP addresses are actually being used in the organization. And, and one way to do that is to send ping requests to each host to each IP address and figure out which ones respond. And now you get this list of systems uh, in, in the network that are, that are actually, that actually, are, you know, there's a computer that's gonna respond to, to network requests. And then from there that you can start um, scanning for what ports might be open um, and what, how, how those different systems might be vulnerable. Um, and again, we're gonna talk about that at some point in the future, but ping is a basic network utility that, um, that uh, helps you identify whether hosts are, are alive in the network or not. Um, another utility is, is uh, NS lookup. So NS lookup. We've talked about um, one of the application layer protocols that I talked about last week was the DNS protocol. And DNS is um, the protocol that, uh, that ties, that allows you to look up the IP address for a specific domain name. And a domain name might be something like, the example I used last week uh, over and over was www.nasa.gov, right? So NASA's website, um, or I could just do, I could just really, what I need to look up is nasa.gov. So if I do an NS lookup of nasa.gov, um, remember, in order for my computer to route packets to another computer, um, I have to know the IP address of that computer. And um, so if my web server, or if my, I'm sorry, if my web browser is going to connect to www.nasa.gov, my computer has to have the IP address of www.nasa.gov in order to route that packet across the internet to that system. And um, I don't know... Um, what that IP address is, but the, fortunately the DNS system is there so that my computer can uh, do a DNS lookup on nasa.gov and discover what that IP address is. And so when I do that, at the command line, I use a tool called NS lookup. And um, what this tells me is that uh, nasa.gov has a couple of different IP addresses. They're both listed here, 23.22.39.120 and 52.0.14.116. It's also got a couple of IPv6 addresses. Why are there multiple IP addresses for nasa.gov? Well, um, that, I, that uh, web server is certainly replicated, replicated in different places in the internet um, so that um, depending on load and depending on um, you know, the health of the network, um, you know, either, either one or both of those systems will be up at any time. Um, and the other information provided by NS Lookup up in the top here is, is um, 
the name of the DNS server. So this is yardbird.cns.ipv6.vt.edu. So that's a DNS server that's running here on, on the Virginia Tech campus. Um, we won't talk a lot about DNS, but um, you know, DNS is a hierarchical distributed database. So it's uh, portions of it are replicated in different portion in different locations throughout the internet. And um, each organization has their own DNS servers um, that support their local users. And then if that DNS server doesn't have the answer to a particular lookup, then it'll go out and ask other DNS servers for the answer. Um, so, now, um, so now I have the IP address for nasa.gov. Now, when I'm gonna browse to that using my web browser, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't necessarily have to do that um, myself at the, at the uh, command line. My web browser is gonna do that automatically when I, when I try to go to nasa.gov using my web browser. Um, okay, so <clears throat> now I'm going to switch over to, let's see, am I, am, I, am I out of slides here? Go back to slides for a minute. Okay, so IP config, I did the ping, I did the NS lookup, and that's that dash NA. We'll take a look at that later on. Uh, okay, so Linux networking. Uh, well, in a second, I'm going to log into a, a, a Kali Linux VM, and we'll do some of this. Um, it's very similar, except uh, in Windows, remember we used IP config to get the networking interface configuration information. On a Linux or a Unix system, we use IF config. Mm, excuse me, why is it different? Um, who knows, you know, different operating systems designed by different people use different words for things. The rest of this stuff is the same. Ping still behaves the same way. Uh, NS lookup behaves the same way and netstat would behave the same way. Um, okay, so now we're going to jump on a uh, Virginia Cyber Range system. So I'm going to switch to another monitor. And I'm going to kill my slides. Okay, so now I'm logging into the Virginia Cyber Range. And I'll log in as a student. And I will go into security fundamentals and I'm going to go to cyber basics environment and I'm going to start my VM. Okay, so I'm going to pull up a, uh, I'm going to pull up a Kali Linux virtual machine and, um, and we'll do some quick, uh, we'll just do quick hands on. I'm going to, I'm going to do some of the similar things that I did at the windows command line on the Linux command line. So we can see how those things function. And then, um, I'm going to pull up Wireshark and we're going to do a little bit of, of uh, web browsing as soon as my VM is up and running. But we're going to look at what, we're going to look at that, um, we're, we're going to look at the, the um, results of the web browsing in the, um, the Wireshark instance and see the different protocol layers. And this is just going to be sort of a brief introduction to Wireshark. Um, and then uh, in, in um, a future lesson next week, we will um, get a little bit deeper with Wireshark. Okay, so I'm using, so I'm using, whoops, what happened? Oh, pop-up blocker. So let me, please allow, okay. So I'm using the Cyber Basics environment in uh, the Virginia Cyber Range. And I'm gonna log in here. And okay, so first thing I'll do is I'll pull up a um, pull up a terminal window, make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. <clears throat> okay, so now if I do if config, not as much going on in terms of network interfaces in this virtual machine, but here is here is uh, ETH zero. That is my um, virtual network interface on this um, Virginia Cyber Range Kali Linux virtual machine. So here's my, here's my uh, network address, 10.1.50.190. And then if you recall on the Windows system, we also had this thing called a network mask. And uh, you know, here's a broadcast address. Um, again, that's not particularly important that you know what all that is. Um, but it's all related to the, uh, to the internet address. And then there's also an IPv6 address. Um, okay, so I, I can also do things like I can, uh, I can ping, 
and I'm going to ping a system that's inside the Virginia Cyber Range here, dvwa.example.com. Okay, and that thing is answering, um, and this thing will, so one difference between ping on a Windows system and ping on a Linux system is what you see right here. On the Windows system, when you do ping, it has this default, um, uh, it'll send four ping messages and then it'll stop. Uh, in, a, in a Linux system, it's gonna continue to ping that thing until you tell it to stop. And um, that's great if you're troubleshooting a network and you're trying to get a system up, you can have, you can start ping and you can have somebody looking at it, looking at that ping response. And then as soon as your computer comes up on the network, they'll see the responses and that tells them that uh, the, the system is now up. Um, but uh, in this case, I'm gonna hit control C to stop. Uh, ping also lets you specify the number of times that you want to send a ping. So if I said ping, whoops, I'm on my wrong keyboard here, ping, uh, I think it's dash P four, and then I say dvwa.example.com. Uh, that obviously wasn't the right switch. Um, anyway, there's a way to limit the number of pings that it sends. Um, and, and you, you see that in this case, I'm using dvwa.example.com. Um, uh, so, and, and if I were to try to ping a system outside of the, of the Virginia cyber range network. So if I was to try to ping, um, www.nasa.gov, I'm not going to get any response from nasa.gov. Okay. Um, why is that the case? Well, um, that's the case because the Virginia Cyber Range prevents students from um, sending ping requests outside of our network. So, um, you know, we, we do things in the Virginia Cyber Range to, to protect students from themselves uh, and to protect the internet from students. And one of those things is we have a web proxy that prevents students from uh, doing things that even smell malicious um, to hosts that are outside of the Virginia Cyber Range Network. So a ping request to a host outside the Virginia, Virginia Cyber Range Network is not going to work. But dvwa.example.com is one of the hosts that's in your student's cyber basics environment. And the example.com domain is um, not a real domain. It's a domain that we used internally in the Virginia Cyber Range. And uh, that's based on... Um, uh, uh, a uh, essentially a rule within um, uh, the, the you know internet protocols that says uh, if you're going to have a a um, internal sort of bogus domain that you use for education or testing, then it should be called example.com. So that's a IEEE uh, or I'm sorry, that's an internet RFC, which those are the rules of the internet essentially. Um, and then I could also, but what, what I can do is I can do a, uh, I can do an NS lookup, NS lookup of nasa.gov. And I get a similar response um, that I got when I did it from my Windows machine. So um, two different IPv4 addresses for nasa.gov and then two different IPv6 addresses for nasa.gov. Okay, why, why do we allow students to do an NS lookup but we don't allow them to do a ping? Um, essentially, it's because an NS lookup is completely passive, right? When you do NS lookup, we're not affecting NASA.gov at all. We're simply looking up an address in the DNS uh, um, uh, um, protocol, look in, in the in the uh, distributed database that makes up DNS. So, so we have um, DNS servers inside our our infrastructure. Students are able to do DNS lookups of hosts outside in the internet. Ping, on the other hand, that's not. Uh, passive that's active when you send a ping message that's gonna that actually sends a message across the internet to the target device which would be a system you know www.nasa.gov was my example and um, so that's sending packets out on the internet and that's not a passive activity that's that's um, could be used maliciously okay so um, now what I'll do is I will um, I'm gonna open up Wireshark so I'm gonna, before I do that, I want to, I'm gonna open up Wireshark and I'm gonna use it to observe live network traffic. And, and um, in order to do that on a, um, on a Linux computer, um, you have to open Wireshark as the root user. 
because a non-root user doesn't have what's called promiscuous access to the wireless access card. And you don't want non-root users to have promiscuous access to the network interface card because that allows people to observe network traffic and you don't want them to do that unless they're an administrative user. Um, in the Virginia Cyber Range, we let students be administrative users because, um, uh, because the, the, you know, the, some of these tools they just can't use if they're not. So I'm gonna become the root user and uh, hopefully folks know how to do this uh, using su the sudo su minus command that, that makes me the root user. And the difference, how do you tell the difference? Well, here um, the prompt is, uh, tells me I'm, my username is student and the dollar prompt means I am a, a, a non-administrative user. And now down here, after I do this sudo su minus, now my username is root and my um, dollar sign, uh, whatever hashtag uh, prompt that tells me that I'm that I'm uh, an administrative user right now. And and so th this you know the user permission levels is something that we will um, do in future WebExes. Um, we've got some introductory Linux uh, hands-on uh, tutorials that we will go through. Uh, in, in these workshops in the future. And so th this, uh, if you're not familiar with some of this stuff, then you will be. Okay, so now I'm the root user and I'm going to start Wireshark from the command line. So I type in Wireshark and I, Wireshark and I give it the ampersand. Now Wireshark's gonna start up. I get a little error that I'm gonna ignore. And so here's my Wireshark. Um, and I'm going to capture traffic on ETH0. So remember uh, ETH0, that's my virtual network interface card on this uh, virtual machine. And um, I'm gonna give it a, I'm gonna put in a capture filter. You just have to trust me on this one. I'm gonna say, um, what's the filter I wanna use? Um, not TCP port 3389. So my capture filter here is not TCP port 3389. And I'm just doing that so that, so that some of the traffic is ignored. Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of traffic on port 3389 between my virtual machine and the, um, and the Virginia Cyber Range. That's what makes this desktop visible through your web browser tab. And so I'm just ignoring a bunch of that traffic. For, for the purposes of this little exercise, it probably doesn't really matter that much because we're gonna use a filter to drill down on the HTTP traffic. Um, okay, so I've got Wireshark up and running and it's, and it's um, observing traffic. Now I've brought up the, uh, all I did here was I brought up the um, Virginia Cyber Range webpage and you see there's all kinds of things going on over here. Um, based on me opening that web page, um, let me open up another tab here, and I'll and I'll well let's let, let me stop there. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit the stop button on Wireshark, and so my um, web browser communicated with the web server, and it resulted in all this network communication. So there's some DNS communication up at the beginning, and if you recall. What, what does DNS do? Well, that translates the uh, domain name to the IP address in order for my web browser to reach out to a web server and grab the web page. And uh, so this, uh, um, when I open the browser, it's, it's set up to go directly to virginiacyberrange.org. So um, the first thing that the browser had to do was do a DNS request to translate virginiacyberrange.org to the specific IP address to call out to to get the, the, um, this web page. So we start with a bunch of DNS traffic, and then I'm gonna go up to my display filter, and I'm gonna type in HTTP, HTTP. And here's the, um, here's the actual communication between my web browser and the web server. That's the HTTP connection. So here you'll see um, I have a GET request, and um, it's requesting, uh, um, okay, so, so here's the original Git request. Here's the response. Um, 
here I have this, uh, oh, connect virginiacyberrange.org. Oh, so, here, so the next thing that happens is there's a request for a, um, a connection on port 443. And uh, why does that happen? Well, that's because this is an HTTPS site. So HTTP runs on port 80 and HTTPS works on uh, port 443. And so we have um, an, an initial connection on port 443. And then the next series of messages are, you see this TLS version 1.2, TLS version 1.2. So this is the web browser and the web server setting up a, a secure connection so that it can, so that we have this HTTPS connection. And once the HTTPS connection is uh, set up, um, all of the data that's transferred between these two devices in, is encrypted. And so now if I look at these packets, so down in the bottom here, um, you see that this, these messages are all encrypted. And so what I'm doing in the bottom, in the, in the center section of um, Wireshark is I'm, you know, the, the top section in Wireshark, each one of these lines is an individual packet communicated between uh, a, a client and a server. The middle section is the, is each of the layers of the, um, in the, in the protocol stack. So starting at the bottom, this is the physical layer communication. Next is the ethernet. If you recall, that's the data link layer communication. Next layer up is the IP uh, layer. So this is the network layer. So this is where we have a source IP address and a destination IP address. Next layer up above that is the, uh, this is TCP. Um, And then next layer up, uh, you know, on, on top of the transport layer protocol, in this case, TCP, trans transmission control protocol, you have, the, um, you have the application layer protocols. And so this is HTTP, but it's using uh, SSL. So it's using um, a secure connection. And so when you look into this traffic, you see in the bottom, this is the, this is the, um, the contents of the packet. You can see it's completely unintelligible right? Can't read it. So any web server that you connect to over HTTPS, when you look at this uh, stuff down in the, in the bottom through what, something like Wireshark, you see that it's un unintelligible. You can't read it. So if you were to type your um, credit card number and expiration date and CVV number into this web page and send it, um, that transmission would be over this secure sockets layer protocol. So it would be encrypted, completely unintelligible. Nobody could eavesdrop on it and, uh, and, and pull out that communication. So let's compare that now. So I'm gonna restart Wireshark and I'm gonna go to a web server that does not use HTTPS. So I'm going to this um, wikia.com website and you see that there's no HTTPS here. In fact, there's a little alert thing um, that might say something like, oh, connection is not secure. Why is it not secure? Because uh, it's not using HTTPS. Okay, so now if I look at some of this communication over here, um, we'll see that there is actually, there are components of this web page that are being communicated over TLS, but um, I'm gonna go up to the very top here And um, and you'll see that there are portions of this communication that you can read down here. And um, trying to find some of it that's that's so so again portions of it are doing this TLS handshake. So so what that is is. The, the overall web page is not using TLS, but some of these ads, for example, um, are coming from different web servers and, and some of these are, are using a TLS co connection. But some of this that is labeled, I should have found a more basic website that doesn't have all the ads in it. Um, here's, a whole, here's a whole bunch of HTTP um, service unavailable. I don't know, next time I'll bring one up that doesn't have, uh, 
But if you look at if you look at some of these HTTP messages, for example, you see that um, the 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 um, data being transmitted here is is not unintelligible. I mean, this is readable, right? This is um, communication between sender and receiver that could be eavesdrop upon. And if that was you sending your credit card number, then um, then you could have a problem, basically. And again, this wasn't a great example. Um, it turns out that it's getting harder and harder to find websites that don't use HTTPS. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, it was it was fairly trivial. In fact, um, a couple of years ago, you could go to the to the um, ACM website. So the ACM is Association for Computing Machinery. And their site was not. Let's see what ACM is doing now. ACM dot org. Oh, it looks like ACM dot org is still not using TLS. Maybe. Um, so here's a bunch of yeah. Anyway, um, so that so that's HTTPS. Um, versus HTTP communication. And maybe for next time, I'll, I'll uh, find some more basic websites that, uh, that aren't partially HTTPS and partially HTTP. Um, and that's also a very basic intro to Wireshark. And um, next time we'll do some more hands-on with networking. So maybe we'll dig into some more Wireshark um, networking examples. And um, for those, we'll probably use recorded uh, packet capture files instead of going out on the live internet um, with the packet capture files, it's a little bit, uh, um, it'll be a little bit more straightforward because we'll have some, we'll have some hands-on exercises that you can use to, to sort of read along while we're doing this. Um, and those are exercises that you'll be able to use uh, in the classroom. All right, I'm gonna quit here just in just a second. What I wanna do first is go back to my slides. And uh, so, so the, the, this is the example I did hands-on using the Virginia Cyber Range, and um, this is the example I use. This is the example you can use if you're not on a Virginia Cyber Range system. So, if you're using a local VM on a laptop or something, you can actually ping nasa.gov, and you can do an NS lookup on virginiacyberrange.org. Um, then we did some hands-on with Wireshark. So here's some more um, background on Wireshark. Here's where you get it. Here's a little bit about display filters and um, more information on display filters. And again, we'll dig more into Wireshark uh, during next week's WebEx. So um, thanks for joining us or thanks for listening and uh, we'll see everybody next week. So thanks. <laughs>